Well, shifting gears to you mentioned the the mental and um, potential benefits that protect against neurodegenerative diseases like dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, that's really, you know, once I saw the research on that, that's something that keeps me using the sauna regularly, even if I don't feel like it, or if you, even if I don't have time, is that potential significant reduction in dementia risk. So could you talk a little bit more about that research and um, yeah, what's known about protection from neurodegenerative diseases? Well, the research looking at sauna use and specifically it's looked at Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it's really limited to just observational data, in which case sauna use is associated with a much lower risk. So like I said, around 60%, 60 to 66% lower if, you, if people are using the sauna four to seven times a week. Now, why that is, is um, a probably, you know, again, very interesting question, probably something coming down to cardiovascular health, right? So if you're, if you're basically in better cardiovascular health, you're going to have increased blood flow to the brain and that's, you know, known to help protect against dementia. Um, but there's also some evidence, and this kind of gets in some, into some of the molecular details with um, sauna use. And something I'm extremely interested in are, are heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins, as their name implies, are activated by heat stress. Um, and so sauna robustly activates them. There's been some studies looking at people that have sat in a about 163 degree Fahrenheit sauna for 30 minutes, they're able to, to activate their heat shock proteins about 50% over their baseline levels. So what are heat shock proteins and why do we even care about them? Well, heat shock proteins are a stress response protein. We can talk a little bit more about what that means later. But um, essentially what they do is they help proteins inside of your cells they help keep their three-dimensional structure. So every protein in your body has a three-dimensional structure and that's important for its function. And these proteins in our body that are doing everything, all the work inside of our cells, they, they don't stay around forever. They eventually, you know, they get chewed up and degraded like in a, in a, in a garbage can, basically, you can think about it. And so um, sometimes, you know, that doesn't happen properly. And as we age, it definitely starts to go awry. And so heat shock proteins kind of, help prevent that from happening. So they help prevent proteins from um, becoming disorganized and destructured because when they become that way, they tend to aggregate and they can form aggregates. And these aggregates can then form plaques. And these plaques can form in places like the vascular system or they can form in places like the brain. So probably the classical example of plaques in the brain are amyloid beta 42 plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So there's been a whole host of evidence in animal studies that have found that elevated levels of heat shock proteins can protect against the formation of amyloid beta plaques, and they can help prevent an Alzheimer's disease-like um, disease in, in animals. So um, there's been a lot of evidence of that, and that I think is one interesting angle because saunas are well known to activate heat shock proteins. And once they're activated, they stay activated for about 48 hours. I mean, they're, they're elevated for a while. And, um, you know, so constant, when you're talking about someone that's doing it four to seven times a week, you know, we don't have empirical evidence looking at a person and measuring their heat shock proteins like each day. But, you know, one could imagine that you would you would see that heat shock proteins are way act way elevated over what their normal baseline levels are, and so what you're having is almost this constitutive activation of this of this family of proteins that essentially help prevent plaques from forming, um, among other things. So, yeah. so I think that's a a really interesting angle as well uh, with respect to to neurodegenerative disease. And in fact, one of my first experiments um, when I was a, an early researcher at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, I was doing some research on nematode worms, C. elegans, where we were injecting them with amyloid beta-42, the peptide fragment that's known to be associated with Alzheimer's disease causing these plaques in the brain. We we're injecting them into these worms and um, into their muscle tissue, and it, it causes the worms to become paralyzed because they have all these 
protein aggregates in their muscle and they can't move anymore. And it's, it's a really distinct phenotype. You look at them under a microscope and they're just, they're still, but they kind of just move their nose around and feed, but they can't move. And so um, I did these experiments where I would boost up their heat shock proteins and like it totally corrected that. Like these worms, even though they had, even though we, we were giving them amyloid beta 42, it it totally corrected them from um, the paralysis because the amyloid beta 42 wasn't forming these aggregates. Mm. So I, I've always kind of go back to that original study that I, you know, had done with my own hands and it's kind of made this this aha moment. I'm like, wow, these heat shock proteins are doing something cool. Is that how you actually got interested in sauna use in the first place from that research? Um, it's how I got interested in the molecular, some of the molecular aspects of sauna use. I would say that uh, the real way I became interested in, in the sauna, um, and this will take us into other brain function aspects, <laughs> if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, so when I was in graduate school, I lived across the street from a YMCA, and I used to go use the sauna almost every day before I would go into the lab and do my experiments. And um, as any graduate student or budding young scientist or even senior scientist will tell you, um, experiments fail. They, they fail all the time. And it's very stressful. It's very hard. Uh, so, so graduate school can be very hard because um, you're constantly being just bombarded down. It's like you're being hit. Like, well, that didn't work. Well, that didn't work. Well, there goes six months of work, you know, and it's, it's a very stressful time. And um, what I started to notice was that using the sauna before going into the lab, my, my ability to handle stress was, is noticeable. Like I was much more capable of handling stress. My anxiety was much lower. I mean, it was very, very noticeable for me where to the point where I was like, something's going on here. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's something. And so I started diving into the literature, you know, way back then in, in like 2009, you know? So, um, and that's where I kind of got into the sauna um, and the effects on the brain. And actually in the publication that that um, we published last year, I kind of uh, riffed a little bit on some, I would say it's still still more of a hypothesis than anything um, in, in terms of the reason for that. You know, when you're when you're in the sauna, you're um, you're dumping a bunch of endorphins, much like exercise. So um, it, it's sort of the same same effect. So endorphins are those feel good opioids that your brain is producing. The counter to that feel good endorphin is the it's called dynorphin, the endogenous counter to it. Dynorphin is is that uh, chemical in your brain that is uh, responsible for making you feel dysphoria, not so good. Um, so the kind of feeling you get when you're really hot, you're sitting in a sauna and you're like not feeling good, like this is hot, or, you know, or when you're going for your long distance run and it's that feeling of, of you just don't feel good, but you have to push past it, right? You push past it. So, um, dynorphin is something that's produced, um, during, during that, that period. And dynorphin is actually involved in cooling the body. So I think that's partly why, uh, your body, your brain is making it when you're, when you're elevating your core body temperature. Um, and the interesting thing about dynorphin is that although it's responsible for the dysphoric feeling, it binds to a receptor in our brain called the kappa opioid receptor. Um, when it binds to that receptor, it ends up doing this whole feedback loop. And this is like the beauty of biology. And the feedback loop is that those feel good endorphins that we make bind to another type of receptor called the mu opioid receptor. And this is the same type of receptor that morphine and opioids also bind to that help make people feel good. Um, they help with pain and stuff. Well, kappa opioids, when you when you bind to that receptor, that dysphoric feeling, it changes the mu opioid receptor. It basically um, makes them more sensitive to endorphins for a longer period of time. And so, uh, you know, I sort of have this hypothesis that like when you get in the sauna and you, you, you know, you, you push past that like this feels terrible. It's hot. Oh, it's hard. You know, you, you push past it a little bit. Um, you get done with it. And, and then the endorphins that you make a day later or two days later or five days later from laughing at a joke or for giving, giving your loved one a hug or whatever it is that's making you release endorphins, you're going to feel them better because they're more sensitive. So um, there was a bit of a tangent, but that's sort of what got me interested in, in using the sauna. And um, as, as you mentioned and alluded to earlier, there is, there's actually a lot of empirical evidence that has now come out since that time looking at 
the effects of sauna use on um, mental health and specifically depression. So um, Dr. Ashley Mason right now, uh, who I am collaborating with, is looking at sauna use and um, people people with depression um, that have not able, been able to manage it with um, different types of standard of care treatments. And so um, she's going off of work from her former mentor, Dr. Charles Raison, who found that basically elevating a person's core body temperature about one to two degrees was able to give people an antidepressant effect that lasted like up to six weeks with a single use. And this was compared to a sham control. Um, they used this device that basically um, made people feel like they were getting a little bit hot, but it wasn't hot enough. So it was a really great placebo control because people thought they were actually getting the treatment. Um, placebo controls are very important, particularly with depression studies because a placebo response is a very real response. So um, so that was that was a really uh, a seminal study looking at you know, just a single session of sauna use and how it had a very robust antidepressant effect up that lasted six weeks in these depressed, depressed patients compared to a placebo control. Now, Ashley Mason is now, she's following up on this and she's using an infrared sauna and she's also, <clears throat> she's also elevating the core body temperature, you know, one to two degrees. And, um, and she's doing now, instead of one session, she's doing up to eight sessions. And, and uh, we're looking at a variety of biomarkers to understand why that is. Like, is there, are there changes in the immune system? Um, and, and there's some preliminary evidence to suggest there are. You know, there have been quite a few observational studies looking at sauna use and how sauna use is associated with lower biomarkers of C, like C-reactive protein. So these are markers of inflammation. Inflammation plays a major role in depression as well. Sauna use also can increase IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory. So that's also been shown in an um, intervention study. So people that have used the sauna, had their blood drawn um, before and after, there was some evidence that, that IL-10 was elevated after using the sauna. So there's some suggestive evidence that, you know, the immune changes may be going on and changing it in a positive way, much like exercise. So exercise also, um, it, it increases IL-6, which is another cytokine that's kind of it's called a myokine. It's released from your muscle and it can cause inflammation, but it's also this type of cytokine that can cause a uh, very powerful anti-inflammatory response. So there's a, a, we can talk about what this means, hormesis. There's a bit of a hormetic aspect to it. Um, so, so that's also very interesting as well. Yeah. And, and with those depression studies and the hypothesis for why um, sauna use. Wow. That's, I mean, it's amazing. One sauna use can have potentially a six week benefit, um, for patients that are, um, uh, having depression. Could part of the hypothesis be that there, cause you mentioned our endorphins and our internal opiate system and how sauna use can sensitize those receptors. So the opiates, our own opiates inside of our body work better. Is that one of the hypotheses too of why this can help patients who are depressed? It is. It is. And we're trying to figure out how to measure that. Like there's there's some tricks and stuff. And so we're we're trying to find some collaborators. And actually we do have some some collaborators that are um potentially gonna help us kind of figure out how we can test whether or not that that is playing a role. It's it's certainly something I think is playing a role for sure. I think there's multiple things at play here. And I think that one of them is, is the, the change in the opioid system in the brain for sure. But you can't measure opioid receptors and, and sensitivity and upregulation like you can in an animal, right? Like in people, like that's not, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not there yet um, with, with our technology. So that would, that would be something that would be really cool. But, um, but there are some other things that can be measured in plasma 